Hello, hello, and welcome to Wanted, a show all about gadgets and gear that Mayor Watt wants and thinks maybe some of you might want. And today is June 15th, 2024. It's season one, episode 17. Means I think, uh, well, well, we're 17 weeks into having the Wanted show out there. Um... Hello, Bipolar Cat. How are you? If you are in my chat and you want me to repeat what you say in the chat, let me know. And uh, I will remember that. However, today we're going to be talking about cable management, yard games, Netgear, the actual company, Netgear, and some of its equipment. Um, Waterproof speakers, portable power, smart lamp, robot lawnmowers, electric camper, a retro e-bike, and a Honda electric vehicle. Because this show, Wanted, is all about gadgets and gear and things that I would think that I would like and that maybe you would like too. So come on over. It's every Saturday. It's usually around 745 when we start because we actually start the entire streaming day at 5 uh, PM Eastern. And then we do a show, take about 15 minutes and then do another show for an hour, etc. Um, we still have after this show, um, war crafters, which is about gaming, first person shooters, role-playing games, um, MMOs, etc. but, uh, usually base building survival and the, the genre that not really the genre, the, the sector of, uh, gaming, um, that involves first person shooters and RPGs and whatnot. So stick around. Um, it's, I don't know, maybe you'll like that one too, but there's 50 shows a week that I'm trying to put together. And so at the end of the day, I can't be everywhere. And so if you are interested in one of these shows, not just the seven that are operational right now, but any of the 50 that are planned, um, you can go over to hometown.com and actually find one that you might be interested in being a host or co-host. Send an email to mayor at hometown.com and uh, we can hash out the minutia of it and um, go from there. Uh, I would like to partake in any of the hosting and co-hosting if you are interested in being a host or a co-host. And um, like I said, we just go from there. All right, let's get into today's uh, topics, our articles. Oh, you know what? Before I do that, so wanted is actually right here under the gadgets and technology uh, category. There's six main categories, about 50, there's 47 that are active, but uh, 50 channels are planned. Each one of those channels are going to be turned into a show here on Twitch and YouTube. And I will be actually facilitating restreaming to others as well um, here in the near future. Um, that said, if you want today's articles, if you type in exclamation point want, that will pull up the articles for wanted. And if you type in pod exclamation point pod, that'll pull up the podcasts. And if you type in exclamation point show notes, it will pull up the commands that are necessary to pull up what I just did um, for each of the shows, as well as the podcast and whatnot. So at any rate, all of the shows get turned into a podcast. They also get ported over to YouTube as long as, as well as the live stream that takes place on YouTube um, because of the way that live streaming works over on YouTube and the way that categories and, and whatnot work over on YouTube. It's never, it's not frictionless at any rate over on Twitch every 60 days, the oldest stream gets dumped just unceremoniously just set on fire and you watch it burn so that's why we have all over 1100 episodes of the various hometown shows on youtube as well as the podcasts um, so do a search for hometown in apple or uh, apple podcasts or wherever you catch pods and you'll find hometown if not let me know and i will remedy it um, but <clears throat> as far as I know, it's everywhere now. Anyway, um, all of this 
is brought to you by hometown.com. So go over and become a citizen. I won't play the intro music, but, or the intro. Let's go. The first article is over on the Warcrafters channel, the uh, best cable management trays for desks in 2024. If you are like me, you have a cable octopus behind your desk. And if you were to try and go, okay, so here in the Ohm, in the mayoral mansion for Ohm Town, um, behind me is an actual green screen um, that I just decided to put back up recently uh, to change the way that it looks behind me. There's actually a lot of stuff back there, but um, so I've got a bunch of space behind me, but on the other side of my monitors and this desk, there is enough cabling, I think, to stretch from here to low earth, uh, low earth orbit. Um, and maybe I'll be able to send stuff out into space. There's so many cables back here. If I were to go back there, I may never come back out. So I want cable management. So the problem with that is when you have power and an HDMI or DisplayPort connector and a cable for cameras um, and lighting, um, speakers. I use two different keyboards, two different mice. Um, wireless doesn't work for me, um, not because of latency or anything like that, but because I don't want to have to babysit batteries, uh, even with rechargeables, which is what I use primarily now. Um, I don't want to have to keep swapping them out. So I've got cables everywhere, you know, printers, VR headset. Um, what else? My gosh. And the computers themselves, right? The, all of those cables converge into a streaming computer and a gaming machine. Um, so it, it, it's really a nightmare. So what are the best cable management solutions? I don't know. Um, I literally don't use them. I have a sit stand desk. And so I watch as my cables rise up from the floor like some Cthulhu uh, deep god uh, rising from the ocean floor to consume me uh, multiple times throughout the day. And I wonder if one of these days something's going to catch and my desk is just going to flip over all on its own. Anyway, GameRant.com does uh, us all a service by providing us a big list for the best cable management trays for desks in 2024. Uh, Michael Akuchi, I think is the how they pronounce their name, put this list together. There are more than what's listed uh, immediately in the display. Oh, no, no, not too many more. Scandinavian hub, no screw under desk cable management tray. Reflying, I guess, no drilling under desk cable management. <clears throat> Upright ergo mesh cable manager. Vivo under desk 17 inch cable management tray. The Vari cable management tray and the D line cable management box. Anything that can fit inside this box, I really doubt is going to be functional for me. But let's see what they say here. The Scandinavian hub no screw under desk management tray is only 17 by 5. <laughs> so um, I've got a I've got a, a, a pretty wide desk here. Um, this thing I would need four of them <laughs> um so this is kind of out for me it says it can hold up to and there's a typo in there hey game ran i found a typo um the tray's not very wide that's the con that they dis discovered too but it allows you to install it without any um, holes being drilled no screws which is great because then you don't damage your desktop um, whatever the surface is like I have a, a sit stand desk that is separate from my tabletop. So I have a custom, not a custom. I've got a larger than regular desk, um, tabletop as my desk. And then it sits on, um, a sit stand desk that, uh, they're not really meant to be together, but they're together. So <laughs> it's pretty awesome. You should do it that way. 
Because then you get the top that you want and you get the legs that you want. You don't you're not really bound by some name brand that's charging you a premium for something that you can buy at a fraction of the cost. I think um, you can get them. Well, I know you can get them cheaper separately from Amazon and then literally screw the legs into the uh, tabletop. And then if you want drawers and stuff like that, you can actually buy those separate too and customize the, your desk to your liking. It's really up to you. Anyway, the Scandinavian no desk is too, or no screw um, under desk cable management tray is too narrow. This one is probably the, the no frills one, uh, reflying, no drilling under desk cable management. It uses the thumb screws to pin it against the desk and then um, it's just this uh, metal tray and it's only 15 inches long. So all of these are really narrow and you'd have to use multiple of these um, and just string them along your desk unless you want them hanging over like in, in little, <laughs> I, I'm going like this, like it means anything to you. Um, so it would just kind of loop on there and then hang off again. Yeah, I don't know. None of these are really working, but that's only 16 bucks and you can get more of them um, pretty inexpensively. Just stick them all side by side. Then there's the upright Ergo Mesh Cable Manager. Um, oh, and it looks like the sentient AI from the future will be joining us here in a little bit. So uh, it says, if neither of the, of the above picks interest you yet, then the upright Ergo Cable Manager should do the trick. It's 37 inches wide. Um, but I don't see more pictures of this. I think I need more pictures. But it's $62. Comes in different colors, has fire retardant UL coating. So at least if something shorts out in the cable management, maybe you'll smell the smoke before it sets the house on fire. Allows you to use many wires, which cable managers, you just lay them in their tracks anyways. It's not a big deal. Um, and it says ideal for height adjustable desks alone. So maybe I'll take a look at that one. Um, but it's $62, but it runs more than half the length of my desk, actually about half, yeah, half the length of my desk. So, but it's only one of them. So you'd have to get to, if you want to run it right up to the edge of the desk for me, at least. Um, then they have the Vivo under desk 17 inch. It's actually 16.5 inches, so hey, round up. Um, it says it's great for MDF um, wood and MDF surfaces, plus it can hold up to 11 pounds of weight. But if you have to screw it into your um, desk, that's a level of commitment you may not be willing to um, partake in. And then these trays, which are like bins, you can run cables through them, set a power brick in it and stuff like that. but. Um, I really don't like those. Um, and then the D-line cable management box says conceals wires quite well. Um, can be used for PCs, Christmas decorations, TV trays. Uh, it's just a, a cable management box. Um, and it's $27. So I don't know. Uh, out of all of these, I think that I would probably go for the upright Ergo Mesh Cable Manager. That sounds like fun. Okay, um, let's go on to the next one. I spent a lot of time on this, but this is what happens. The lists turn me into basically uh, going down the rabbit hole. Um, the next article is over in the Warcrafter channel. It's Hot Yard Game Summer, the best lawn games. Uh, it says, get in, loser. We're going to a cookout and we're not playing bags. And we're not playing bags. Um, all right. One second. So Charlie Hall, Zoe Hanna, and Chris Plant put this article together for Polygon. Um, I don't know what that means. We're not playing bags. So ladder ball is one of the um, options. So ladder ball set, steel frame, I've never heard of ladder ball. Do you throw these balls in like bolos and try to loop it around? Yeah, I guess so. 
Want to enjoy an easy tossing game with your friends and family that doesn't require good aim? I got you. Ladder Ball is a simple and silly tossing game, but rather than individual balls or bean bags, it's two balls connected um, with about six inches of rope between them. As such, you get to toss the ball. Yeah, it's like bolo throwing. Interesting. Um, when you use those right, you can actually catch somebody that's running. It tangles up in their legs and um, down they go. Bloop. Anyway, looks interesting. Top rung is worth three points. Not sure why the rungs really matter. I mean, I guess it's you don't have as many options. The top rung is worth three points. The middle is worth two points. The bottom is worth one. Huh. Okay, I think the middle one should be worth one because you have both the bottom rung, which only has one chance uh, above and it. And then the blue rung should have three points because it only has one option above it or below it and, and then above it. But the, the one in the middle has two options for you to get something. So if you land on it, that's kind of like the, well, I have a one in three chance not quite the same um anyway and then there's cub i don't know what cub is viking chess doubles as an elevator pitch the long game in which players stand on opposing sides of a rectangle hurling batons at wooden pylons mixes the strategy if not quite the depth of its heady board game peers with the scandinavian pleasure of smashing hard things together <laughs> okay let's see I don't know what it it doesn't actually describe it or does it uh the toughest part of getting the first person to join in but once a couple of people start playing expect friends and neighbors to ask for their turn to toss one stick at another one interesting okay i might have to get that just so that i say that i've got it <laughs> both of these these are probably the least known games that I've ever heard of, uh, that I've ever found. So I want these simply because of their unique, um, their unique, uh, I guess, description, their, their uniqueness. That's the word that I'm looking for. Anyway, ladder ball, cub, then something called spike ball, round net, AKA spike ball. I guess you spike it down into that net. Um, Jeff Nurek is responsible for creating this creating round net in 1989 in it players gather near a round trampoline style net and spike a ball back and forth between two teams uh game is usually played 2v2 or 3v3 either way action is fast and furious could play the game seated with beer in hand sure but it's a lot more fun to tear it up on bare feet on a beach and get a little silly while you're able one second, I'm sorry, folks. Doink. So at any rate, um, spike ball is 70 bucks. I would probably wouldn't get that one because for 70 bucks, I'd rather be, I'd rather play cub and throw a bunch of wood at other wood um, or bolos at three sticks. Come on. How, how could you knock that? Hey, welcome to the show sentient ai from the future yes yeah, sorry i'm running late today but That's glad okay. to join well um then there's trackball which it looks like there was another game i used to play this i used to have this um it's like highlight except those balls sit inside this little catch um uh, what is it looks that? like lacrosse a lacrosse bit. yeah but the stick isn't as long. Um, yeah, I used to have this. Oh my gosh, that's probably why. The previous iteration, a circa 1990s design, is also available online. No. Well, at um, least it's not vintage. No, no. It, if you're from the 90s, aren't you vintage nowadays? Anything over 35 is vintage, isn't it? Oh, I thought the 80s were vintage. I'm not sure. I think it's a rolling number. It's anything 35 years or, or older is there is vintage. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We'll we'll do it live. Um, uh, 
Oh gosh, at least 20 years old, but less than 100 years is, is vintage. True vintage is a subcategory for items that are at least 50 years old. <laughs> well, the original fun. range is pretty broad. Mm, mm, mm. So it says, uh, my version of semi-organized trackball is uh, a lot like Great Catch, a game that should be familiar to anyone who's ever played youth baseball, which I've never like I, I've never heard of Great Catch and I've played youth baseball um, in my youth. Did you just say youth? No, you didn't. Um, try it now. Go ahead. Try. No, OK. So uh, maybe you're lofting the ball over your opponent's head just far enough away that they can barely reach it before it hits the ground. Or maybe you're curving it to such a degree that they run headlong right or left and intercept it before it passes them. Anyway, trackball, 27 bucks. These are this is a beach game for sure. Um, but the other two, I don't know. Oh, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, I was trying to find great yeah. catch, but I think I found the wrong thing. It was like beach games and other things, which I don't think that's what this was. Great catch sounds like a dating app. <laughs> yeah, I guess it could be. <laughs> so I want trackball only to uh, the nostalgic part of this. I think it would be fun. Um, and uh, I, I could probably. I, I would not spike it for round net where you, I guess you just whack a ball into the net and it might bounce out or something. Uh, I'm, I keep looking at it going, what? So in it, players gather near a round trampoline style net and spike a ball back and forth between the two teams. The game is usually played either way. Um, the action is fast and furious, but it doesn't say like how you win. I don't know. Back to pickleball, I guess. Anyway, and, and then, what could go wrong? Like all the people are in close proximity, and unless oh, yeah. you have good aim, and you know, yeah, you're gonna poke an eye out. So then there's cub, where you throw wood at wood. You can't really knock that. How can how can you how can you mess that up? And then there's ladder ball. So you weren't here for this one, but we'll keep on going. So Kath says. Uh, yeah, is it okay to say what you say in in the chat, Kath? Because I won't um, I won't repeat what's said in the chat unless. Okay, great, thank you. So Kath says um, I played trackball as a child, but they were a bit bent, curved. Yeah, so that's what I remember. I I don't think that these are flat. The just the perspective. I think it has like a little curve inside it so that it traps the ball down in this kind of like high. Yeah, it looks like a scoop kind of. Yeah, or a lacrosse net. It it catches here and then can slide all the way down here. And I, I even remember this having little teeth, and this has little teeth on it, um, where the ball grabs on to give it a so that you can do English on it. Like you can snap your wrist and it curves the ball. Um, I remember whacking people with the ball like you, you're charging me and I just wink like being them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's the objective of the it, game. It may not be, but this is full contact trackball. Um, you don't mess around with full contact trackball. All right, let's keep going, though. Uh, I just gave you three out of four because I only want three out of the four. This spike ball one seems like not my style, I suppose. I don't know. I'll I take think the it's going to bounce off of somebody's head or something. <laughs> yeah, we can bounce that off of each other and uh, come to the some, same conclusion that we're not going to buy this. OK, so let's go on to the next article. This is in Technology Today. Netgear is releasing more affordable versions of its Orbi and Nighthawk routers. Um, so the Orbi 770 is starts at seven hundred dollars. These are crazy. So the Ar Orbi 970 starts at a jaw dropping seventeen hundred dollars. Seventeen hundred. I mean, what does this do? Like route traffic from space? Yeah, I was going to say it, it doubles as a repeater for NASA. There you go. So let's just jump over to this because you're going to go. Wait, I'm paying how much for what? So it's a mesh system and a standalone device. Um, Lawrence Bonk over at Engadget.com put the article together and Netgear 
to me has always had wildly inflated prices for their technology. Um, I've had a Nighthawk router. I've switched to a completely different brand um, that is uh, prosumer and requires more infrastructure and more um, babysitting in the setup part of it. Um, these are usually you just set them up and connect everything and it just works kind of a thing. But the Orbi 970 starts at $1,700. And so they're releasing lower priced versions that are always hobbled. Um, so the Orbi 770, on the other hand, starts at $700, which I th still think is exorbitant. Right. Um, that doesn't sound like a bargain yet. <laughs> It says it supports up to 100 simultaneous devices, which in the land of Wi-Fi 7 is great, um, but still at $700 um, to put that in perspective. Well, hold on. The top speed gets hit, uh, gets a hit when compared to the 970, 11 gigabits versus 27 gigabits. Wireless isn't really the problem overall wired internet speeds to your to the gateway what your internet can actually support that's where a big bottleneck is so inside a network fine um but I, i'm not sure what anybody is doing where they're going to be needing 11 gigabits or 27 gigabits um but either way if you're going to do this you're going to pay the premium price um, 27 gigabits is a tremendous amount of speed, um, but it's the wired component of the rest of this that isn't going to support 27 gigabits. Because um, we're talking like fiber optic speeds for crying out loud. Right, which most people aren't going to have. Right. So... Uh, the top speed gets hit when compared to 970. This is uh, almost a third of the um, price, I, I suppose, and the bandwidth. Uh, remember, an internet speed of one gigabit per second is actually a thousand megs per second. Um, so there is a, a, a difference here. Anything above 1000 megabits is more than enough for streaming and web surfing. So Orbi 770 offers 11 times that. But this is inside the network, not outside the network. So if you're transferring large files, um, you want a faster network all the time. So one 1,000 megabits is, I guess it's going to be okay. But the three pack will cover 8,000 square feet. And there are a pair of 2.5 gigabytes. See, there we go. Gigabit, by the way. Little B is bit. Big B is byte. So be, make sure that when you're doing your calculations, you remember that. 2.5 gigabit LAN ports for wired connections to a gaming console. Um, so remember, we're back at this. <laughs> so if your wired connection is 2.5, and your Wi-Fi is 27 or 11, your bottleneck is your wired. So for whatever reason, LAN is still 2.5 gigabits, wired connection for gaming console or shared storage device. Um, you place these in various places and it gives you the coverage. Um, is it like a repeater? It's mesh, yeah. And so it'll bounce it. And so each one of those hops slows down the connection. There's a reliability issues. Noise, wireless noise um, always becomes a problem, particularly in places like um, like apartment complexes and stuff like that, that becomes kind of a nightmare trying to find enough something that is separate from the rest. But if you are the one that's operating in Wi-Fi 7 range, you will be the outlier because you can use six gigahertz instead of five and 2.4, um, which everybody else will be using. But as time moves on, more and more people will switch over to Wi-Fi 7. Another side effect of Wi-Fi 7 is when it says support for up to 100 simultaneous devices, depending on the technology they use, it can actually have sustained connections instead of old school Wi-Fi 6 um, and previous iterations of Wi-Fi would do channel hopping, device hopping. Um, so not every device was always connected. Um, so 
With Wi-Fi 7, multiple devices are connected to the router at the same time. Um, and that's one of the things with the Nighthawk. The old school Nighthawk systems allowed simultaneous connections because it was multiple antennas, but you paid through the nose for it in the Orbi 970 at 1700 bucks is reminiscent of that wild pricing. Um, and then that actually brings us to the Netgear Nighthawk RS300 standalone router and not a mesh system. This supports 9.3 gigabits um, by itself, 2,500 square feet of coverage and a hundred devices. Um, still this one is 330 bucks. <coughs> so depend it, it's really how easy you want to make your life. You get this in your operational, you get the mesh, you can cover a whole bunch of space. It's actually better to use a mesh if you have dead zones, because you can put that one of the, the uh, mesh network devices in that dead zone and it would repeat from the dead zone out to the next node and then re um, take that to the main node, um, whichever one is sending out to your it seems like it would cover way more square footage than most people might need, at least in a residential environment. Yeah. And that's in an optimal setting, 2,500, um, with no, um, nothing to occlude the, the signal to attenuate the signal, nothing to block the signal. Um, 2,500, but, uh, 2,500 square feet is like the perfect, uh, setting. You never get that. Um, okay, let's keep going though. We've got a whole bunch of articles and we're already 30 minutes into the show. So, um, the author of this article over at Gizmodo says, I love JBL's new portable waterproof speakers. I actually really love portable waterproof speakers. You can take them to the beach. You can take them to, um, the pool. You can hang them in the shower. You can pretty much, um, just abuse them, uh, wherever you want to take them. They say, uh, I am the person in my friend group responsible for all of our tech needs. And I take my job seriously. They got a spare power bank an instant camera. And most importantly, a Bluetooth speaker with them at all times, no matter the occasion, apparently. Wow. So you can I mean, understand. I guess you always need music. You always need music. Duo Rashid is the author. Uh, the deck statement says I've been taking the $50 JBL go for everywhere they go for they don't actually say the last part there but anyway so the clear scene was their portable speaker of choice when adventuring in new york city then they switched to the uh, sony's alt field one which is the new naming um vernacular i guess for the product line to make it easier to understand remember oh, the article right yeah they had the one with all the numbers and letters and it was just gibberish yeah, and now they've made it equally. Like, how do you identify with that Sony Alt Field One? Sure, got it. Um, we talked about this in one of the Wanted episodes a while back um, when it was launched in May, actually. So if you go back to May and look. Um, but both pill speakers took up too much space in their picnic tote bag and weighed it down. So they switched to the clip five JBL shower speaker. See what I was saying? You can just hang that in your shower, take it with you and hang it wherever you want to. And you don't have to worry about uh, shorting out or anything. 12 hour battery life easily lasts weeks before you need to tether it to a socket. The go for lasts around seven hours, more than enough for a day out with the friends. I wonder if you can even take it into like flooding conditions. Yeah, I don't know what it's actual. Does it say? I don't think it says it anywhere, right? Like what it's waterproof. Oh, IP76. Yeah, so water and dust rating. Um, that's among the highest resistance to dust particles, splashes, rain, and sweat a speaker can have. They're in, uh, specifically impressed with. So I would not submer submerge this. I think you have to be 60. What is it? The IP? Hold on. I don't, I don't remember. remember what the rating numbers are. We were just talking about that. Yeah. We're looking at that. Yeah. So 68, 
um, an eight for total protection against water ingress up to and including complete submersion below one meter for more than 30 minutes. And you can go deeper than that, but um, yeah. Anyway, uh, but sitting in the shower, as long as you're not submersion, submerged, submersing it in water. Thank you. It was a hard word for whatever reason. Um, you'll be fine. And then um, this is the, what do they call it? Tried the feature with a clip five and go four, and the result was a cool stereo effect that sounded too good for a $130 setup. So I think they linked them together. The process is straightforward, takes less than a minute to set up. Can't think of a simpler way to have multi-directional stereo uh, uh, sound. So, or a cast, the multi-speaker connection uh, protocol. So. They have a, a dedicated button for AuraCast, which if you don't get these, then you don't have that ability. Like mine, my old J, uh, JBL is um, doesn't have AuraCast. So you know what that means. Time to get a new one. Wanted. That's, that's why we put the show together. Let's keep going, though. Uh, the next article is over in... Uh, technology today as well no airport wall outlets no problem five gadgets that this author packs to avoid digital disconnect um, i am always on the lookout for another battery pack something that extends my ability to stay connected um, unexpected delays can leave you grasping for wi-fi outlet or networks sorry or wall outlets to save your tech batteries um, these items help they fit in your carry-on so plus you uh, don't want to sit on the floor at the airport which you often have to do if you need to use some of the outlets correct um so kamanzi constable is the author of this article unexpected delays can leave you grasping for wi-fi networks or wall outlets by the way i just because of what i do um i don't like using public uh, wi-fi so either a cellular signal um or if i have to I would go sat phone, <laughs> but I will not connect to public Wi-Fi. And didn't we have another article in hometown where somebody jokingly put a threatening statement out using yes. airport Wi-Fi and then I think got arrested? Yes, they got they got arrested in the airport. They tracked that person down, um, which isn't that actually hard to do. Um, so the article says no one expects their next flight to be delayed or canceled, but the reality is that it happens and it happens often. Um, a recent survey found that 25% of Americans plan to travel internationally this summer. If you're one of them, pack one or more of these items in your carry-on so that you don't get in a pinch in the event of an unexpected delay. <clears throat> the Rome Wi-Fi 4G LTE mobile hotspot router. I have a version of this sitting in the mayoral uh, studios closet right now. Um, so that if I travel, all I have to do is put in a new SIM and I'm operational. So even my local phone, I can route through this. Um, tablets, computers, whatever, I can route through a mobile hotspot. Um, and so they say in Kenya, where the family is from, they had to tether off by their phone because the network at the Airbnb was non-existent. So um, they stayed at too many hotels with terribly slow Wi-Fi. So, yep, 160 bucks. Plus, you might not want to be connected to the hotel Wi-Fi. Yeah, because when you use their connection, you're within their security profile. <clears throat> so you better have a robust um, VPN. So all of that marketing about VPNs is true, but you got to get a reputable one. Or otherwise, you are in their security envelope. So... Um, Epica yeah, trading Universal. one problem for another. Yep. Um, Epica Universal Travel Adapter. Everyone should have one of these. Um, nowadays, they come with USB-C and USB-A connections, but you can swap out whatever plug you need to plug in to whatever outlet you're in. Um, these are awesome, and they're getting smaller and more robust. Um, the one that I have right now is like as big as my fist and it's like a room size one <laughs> yeah <laughs> probably like won't fit in the carry-on limitations eniac yeah if you watched snl <laughs> oh wait that's a that was an older episode 
So they tried to carry on a bag that was like as big as a door frame. It was pretty funny. So 23 bucks and literally, unless it's stolen or lost, these things stay working forever and ever. Just throw it in your go bag. And when the NSA comes to get you, all you have to do is grab that backpack and out you go. Wait a minute. Never mind. Um, You've said too much. Uh, then there's the Anchor Mini Power Strip Extension Cord. Uh, these are always great because you can plug in one outlet and it breaks it out into multiple. Um, you can get others that are bigger than this or ones that just focus on USB-C. Um, I would advise getting something like this as well as um, Anchor wall warts so that you can plug wall warts into this and get USB, multiple USB-C adapters, uh, connections out of it. Um, so I have something similar to this, um, as well as probably some of these other things that are in here. Uh, I don't think you can ever have enough chargers. Um, or nowadays, USB-C cables. Yeah, that's very true. Just gotta keep going. Get more and more and more and more and more and more. <laughs> uh, so far, I want one of all of this, so um, I wanna update all of this stuff but we better keep going. Um, you definitely need um, a power bank. So let me back up a little bit. This thing, wow, this zoom went from that to that. Nothing in between. There's just a no middle ground here. Yeah. Boom. Anyway, I can't see it to, oh my God. Anyway, um, Anchor Maggo power bank. You should always have a power bank with you, if not two or three, at least one for each person that's going on your trip. Um, at least one for each person that's going on your trip. You really should do more than that. Um, and but, plus you need them on day trips too, not just yeah. like long vacations. If you're going to be somewhere for a full day, that really helps because you can run out of your device pretty fast. Yeah, particularly when you're tracking your location in real time, you know, the, the map is always updating. It drains that battery really fast. And there's sometimes, like the other day, um, my iPad... Uh, wouldn't charge and lo and behold it was a, a dirt move but by the time i realized the dirt move it was already too late it wasn't charged enough to last a full day um but if i would have had this i could have just grabbed it plugged it in and off we go and it has a chi charger so all you have to do is drop your uh, phone on top of it and it'll charge right from there it's not as um, efficient but um, it is what it is and it's 89 bucks. And I'm I'm a big fan of Anchor. Um, they've had a couple of issues over the years. Um, but as a as far as I know, they've only had two battery related issues. Um, of course, it's always bad when something blows up. <clears throat> Never mind that though. <laughs> minor detail. <laughs> minor, minor detail. Yeah, they yeah. did have one recall recently, but by and large, they have good products. Yeah. And the quality is really tremendous. So a laptop stand, but I never use a laptop stand. I, I don't really know the purpose of them. Uh, in like a power computing kind of thing with a, a, a really fast, high powered laptop, then it improves airflow. But for the most part, you've got a monitor, you've got a display that <laughs> you can angle, you know, use it. Um, so I don't really care about that kind of stuff, but Oh, and then they have other things, other other um, articles, but I'm all over the power and the connectivity stuff. That's that's really important to me. Nothing worse than being somewhere and you run out of battery and you don't have any connectivity to save your butt. Right. And then you can't, you know, check your location or do whatever you need Anything. to do, particularly if you're not in the local area. That's right. Um, okay, let's go on to the next article, and it's over in Hometown Daily. Philips U jaunty sunrise smart lamp is called the Twilight. Philips uh, Philip Hughes next smart bedside lamp will reportedly be called Twilight. The lamp will feature two buttons on top for power, scene selection, and sleep automation, and it has LEDs in the back that will feature a sunrise or sunset effect, according to hueblog.com. That's a niche article or a niche uh, <laughs> it is i wonder how many people go to hue blog hmm. so uh wes davis over at the verge.com put the article together and the deck statement says phillips also seems to be releasing a new led light strip soon 
all I see is Darth Vader. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I was expecting something that looked like a vampire based on the name. Oh, Twilight. Yeah. And when the light comes out, it glitters instead of. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but I guess Twilight with lighting does make sense. And this angle makes it look like a mushroom with stairs or a bookshelf inside it. What? I don't understand what's Maybe going on Maybe it's like here. a little house and it has a uh, stair. I don't know. Oh, and this is a nun. This one is a nun. So it's Darth Vader in black and then in white is a nun, right? I don't know. I mean, those are kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. I like suppose. a 13th century nun, right? Rear LED and main light. Um, like the Hue Dimera's top and bottom lights will apparently be individually controllable. And when triggering its sleep automation, the site says that it'll simulate a sunset before turning off. Kath says, oh my, now I can't unsee it. Yep, forever. It reminds me of the little Pixar short with the <laughs> little lamps. The lamp? Particularly the, the right one, yeah. It's the new one. It's the the Cybertruck version of the Pixar lamp. I don't understand. I do. Do people actually buy these where they're so hard coded in their design that it has zero uh, configurability, zero modification, and it stands yeah, out. It's so know. overt. Well, and hue lighting is really good. Yeah. But yeah, this is very specific, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. There's something about it. Like I want to dress it up so that it looks like a gnome or something on the side of the desk. Just, I don't know. There's something. Would there's... it also travel around and, and send uh, pictures back or whatever? Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't know. The... Okay. I chose this article because I want more hue bulbs and hue lighting. And I have stuff like all throughout the mayoral, uh, mayoral mansion. I have hue bulbs, um, and, and other fixtures, light fixtures, like the stuff that's behind me. You can't see it because I have my green screen up, but, um, yeah, Kath, see, don't, don't support this. I don't think that you should support this. Here's the quote glue a lightsaber to it <laughs> oh my god you should <laughs> yeah i'm gonna turn it off and all i'm gonna hear is <sighs> damn it darth go oh, to bed you could add one of those sound effect things from <laughs> darth vader costumes that's right yeah <laughs> and when i turn it on it needs to make that darth vader sound uh the lightsaber sound <laughs> 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 Oh, God, I can't get this out of my head now. Now I really do want it. <laughs> I think it's it's actually kind of cute, but. <laughs> oh. Well, then the white one for you. You can have the nun. <laughs> In their habit, right? That... No, maybe not. Anyway, Hugh blog published leaked images. Fine. Oh, OK. <laughs> All right. Might have to paint this one like a, or the, the white one like a mushroom, put like a little red, paint oh, it red right, with white yeah. dots or, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, we got to keep going. We're running really late. Uh, the next article is over in Technology Today. Ditch the chore, embrace the robot, your guide to robot lawnmowers. I love the idea of a lawnmower just running around and doing its own thing, not having to pay a landscaper. The mayoral mansion has huge tracts of land <laughs> robot lawnmowers have picked up uh, loads of new features while gaining uh, reliability but there are still some things to consider before you buy CNET put the article together Chris Weddle is the author of this look at that just running around oh my gosh, mowing that the lawn. looks like a go-kart or something chasing These the children pretty... down heavy duty <laughs> exactly get off my lawn or i'm gonna send my robot lawnmower after you hey there's a dual purpose you never want to have a single purpose item never yeah you want a multitasker that's for sure uh, are we slowly reaching the point where in sci-fi movies robots become so common that we forget that uh, they are there yes 
and that's how it should be. But look at this, this, this robot, there's a picture for those of you who are downloading the podcast, you know who you are. Leave a review, damn it. Anyway, there's a picture here from Chris Weddle. The robot lawnmower has to be like giving them the bird and just bolting down the lawn. Like I'm not coming back like a dog that finally broke off of its leash. Right. I was thinking the other way. It's like having a standoff and it's going to start doing like the Jaws music or something as it approaches. We're going to need a bigger yard. (laughs) So they talk about this, putting it in, um, putting in the work and, and doing some research into my goodness. But here's the thing. The reason why I brought this up is you can have all kinds of options. They're going to change over the years, the configurability, the, the capability, but they're expensive, $2,000. You know, you're not going to be buying a, you can buy a cheap robot vacuum for around 150 bucks or a high end option for 2000. Meanwhile, a cheap r- mower is $500, but you're going to be spending more. And this one says, especially when you consider a good riding lawn mower will cost you thousands. And you still have to do the work. But there I guess are it depends all these... on what your alternative is, right? Like, are yeah. you mowing it by yeah. hand? Are you paying somebody? If you're paying somebody, it might pay for itself pretty quickly if it can do the job. Yeah. And one of the problems that you have to worry about is depending on your neighborhood, these things disappear and you have to track it with GPS. Um, and if somebody knows about it, then they can remove it. They can disable it. Um, but a cheap robot lawnmower can do a great job while they haven't tested any robo mowers in the $500 range yet. They tested the uh, Husqvarna auto mower 430 XH. Um, apparently they like it. These mowers are wonderful for a smaller yard as they will bounce off the virtual walls formed by a boundary wire that you have to bury in the ground and then it tracks it. And then it mows only within that area. Um, but you have to worry that depending on the angle of attack of hills and other obstacles, or if you're, um, look, this person's lawn is a golf course. Most people don't have a, oh yeah, very straight. Yeah. This thing, you could probably put boards on it and, and mill the boards flat off of the surface of this lawn for crying out loud. So are they safe? I would say they are. Um, And and that's exactly what I was going to say. You know, a fork isn't safe if you're a a derp and you poke yourself in the eye. That's why we put corks on the forks. That's true. That's very important. In the mayoral mansion. So what kind of maintenance do lawnmower, uh, robot lawnmowers need? Uh, The same as regular lawnmowers electric lawnmowers in particular, um, you have to do all of the updates, upkeep, Uh, clean the blades, lube the chassis, make sure that its charging port is free of any debris. Um, How long does it take to charge them? Think car, so. Oh no, does it have the 80% problem? um, All batteries do. Does it have the weather problem? Uh, Usually not, like if your lawn is a pool, then yeah. You're, you're, <laughs> it's going to flood, but it says essentially it comes down to battery capacity and it's a loud charging rate. It could take an hour to fully charge or a couple of hours. So if the robot mower is in the middle of cutting your lawn and the battery runs low, it'll head back, dock, recharge, go back out. But that's the thing about it. You tell it, just go mow and it goes out and mows. And so you have to trust that the neighbor kid isn't going to go, that is awesome and make it disappear one day. Right. Yeah. Now it has a spinning good. blade. And also, I guess depends on how long it's out there. You know, if it kind of moves around and then goes back into its home, maybe, but even that the home has to be accessible too. And it can't be too accessible. Correct. Yep. So I want a uh, robot lawnmower, uh, plain and simple, because if you're paying somebody to mow your lawn, um, it can in short order pay for an entry level um, lawnmower, depending on what it is you're paying. Um, Kath says uh, Husqvarna is a Swedish brand. 
So let's see. Do they talk about any of the others? They had three in, on their lawn. So they just had, say that. Um, it doesn't seem to really ones? hone in on the brands. No, it doesn't. Or models. That's OK. I think what's going to end up happening is in one of the wanted shows, I'm going to grab an article that is. See, we only we only grab the content that is from that week. Um, and so from last Saturday until this Saturday, that's the articles that we grab. Um, so maybe I'll end up doing some more looking at this. And then the next article we talk about this kind of stuff, um, I'll be even more informed. But I have actually looked at these, including the Husqvarna model. Um, and in all of these cases, depending on the the build of your lawn, this could be a waste of time because it'll go down the hill, but it will never come back. Or it might go tumbling down the hill, depending on how steep the grade is. Kat says that the uh, lawnmowers are pretty common in Sweden. These, the, the robot lawnmowers. That's interesting. I didn't yeah. realize that. I mean, that would make sense since it's from that country, but I didn't realize. I thought that was more of an American thing. Yeah, you'd think... I don't know, I, but I love the idea of this. I definitely want one, um, but you have to weigh, you know, okay, is it going to actually do everything that you need it to do? It doesn't do edging, right? It do, it may not respect the, the fidelity of um, like your planters and stuff like that to get close enough. Um, it's definitely not going to weed anything. So the lawn's going to look great, but you're, all of the planters and all of the bushes are going right, to look like... you'll still have to cut the shrubs and all of that. Yeah, exactly. So, Or you can roll it into your groundskeeper doing it or you know, getting Edward your... Says, Edward Scissorhands. <laughs> wow, I didn't suspect that, that was going to pop up. Uh, we started... We watched more than half of Edward Scissorhands um, day before yesterday. Yeah. Um, and haven't gotten back to it, but yes, we should hire Edwards, uh, Edward S Snowden. No, that's not the right person. Uh, I don't Mobile think Lawn. we should hire <laughs> him. <laughs> Them. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let's go on. The next article is over at uh, four wheel tech, uh, the Volkswagen ID buzz already getting the upscale electric camper treatment. There's no two ways about it. The ID Buzz is an excellent little retro runabout that combines cutesy styling with cargo van practicalities and a bundle of electric joy. But since its launch, the ID Buzz from Volkswagen has been crying out for one major upgrade, a camper van conversion. And now we get to see it. Are these really out? I didn't think that they were out yet. Yeah, I didn't think they were released. I'll check. I'm on the buy list for the canoe. I don't know if I ended up on this. Uh, obviously not. Otherwise, maybe it's not in the United States. So uh, it's over. The article's over at Jalopnik. Owen Bellwood is the author. I think it starts at like 50000 or 60000 or something like that. Yeah, I want to say it might be higher than that. Uh, the Volkswagen ID Buzz electric van has finally begun its new life as a battery powered camper thanks to a small Dutch company. Oh, and regarding uh, mowing the lawn, and I would probably apply this to everything. Um, Kath says people are too busy today. I agree. So uh, created by Dutch company, and I will probably be pronouncing this absolutely incorrectly, Venci. Um, which has made a name for itself building lovely little campers. This ID Buzz build takes the electric, um, uh, the standard electric bus, B-U-S-S, um, and packs it full of all the niceties you'd want on any camping trip. Oh, that's pretty cool. What was the other one? Um, what was that other car that was oh. so expensive they wouldn't price it because it was a one-off like was it land rover yeah i don't remember what it was though but by the way um id buzz in the u.s mid 
2024, but it doesn't look like it's actually been released yet. So it must be soon. Gotcha. So you get like a set of shelves and cubbies. Um, it looks like a sink is there. He's making a charcuterie or something. Um, inside is a couple of seats and a fold away table. This is like a regular old camper conversion. It's pretty cool. For your 95,000 euro, you'll get a fully kitted out camper built on a VW 77 kilowatt hour electric drivetrain. Means that there's more than 200 horsepower, a top speed of 90 miles per hour downhill in a hurricane, and an all electric range of around 233 miles, which you'll lose 2% of every year. Um, which is down on the 263 mile range that VW touts in Europe, thanks to extra weight of all those camper van bits. So yeah, it says despite delays hitting some of its EVs, VW will put the ID buzz on sale in the U S later this year. Like all we had to do was wait a little bit. Um, all the answers. We were too impatient. Yeah. Well, we were too busy. Um, to make matters worse, won't even accepting, uh, what to make matters worse, won't even accepting pre-orders from anyone clamoring to get their hands on the EV when it finally does arrive stateside. Oh, that's why. <coughs> Cass says that they like the look of it. I agree. Um, I actually do. I really do like, um, the ID buzz. Um, I don't like the name of it, but that's okay. Um, as it's for the camper, cute, as was the original. Yeah. Um, and I knew somebody that used to do, uh, conversions by taking Porsche engines and putting them inside these, um, BWs and Were they super zippy. Yep. 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 Um, and other things they did other things, but it was custom work, but I love the idea of this. And because the way that they talked about it was like it was going to be this wildly expensive vehicle, I never kept my name on uh, the list, I think, for the VW. And I went with the canoe because I liked the canoe because it was closer to the original VW styling because um, this has a, a bigger aerodynamic. It's more um, sloped, right? The yeah. other one was more boxy. Yeah. And, and so the canoe is more boxy. So, and I like that one. So if you're looking for something that's similar to this and is actually making its way to the market as well, it's canoe C A N O O. Okay. And not the alcoholic drink. There's a canoe alcoholic drink too. I was going to say not the boat and not the boat either. Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, if you mistake any of those for the vehicle, then there's a problem already. All right, let's keep going. That might mean you're using the alcohol or yeah. lost at sea or something and hallucinating. <laughs> or a little wet. Um, so the next article is over in four wheel tech mod easy, a retro e-bike with a sidecar perfect for Indiana Jones cosplay. And that's because on Fridays I do Indiana Jones cosplays. You do? Do yeah. you do that in a hometown? No, I do not do that. But I just wanted to say that. Um, as some R's readers may recall, the ar uh, article's author reviewed the Maven cargo e-bike earlier this year as a complete noob to e-bikes. And for their second foray into the world of e-bikes, they took an entirely different path. The stylish Maven was designed with utility in mind. It's safe, user-friendly, and practical for accomplishing all the daily transportation needs. The second bike is $4,300 Mod Easy Sidecar 3. It's the other end of the spectrum, according to the author. Just a cursory glance makes it clear. Let's take a look at this thing. <laughs> so okay, Beth that's Mole. cool with the sidecar. <laughs> yeah, so this looks like the motorcycle... Um, with the sidecar from Indiana Jones, except that it's an e-bike and very, very retro. Um, I would not feel safe in this thing if it was standing still in my garage. No, but it looks neat. <laughs> if it's posed on the side of the road or something. And as much as uh, I'm sure that this mean this says something else, what does this say? 
oh, I was easy. trying to figure that out. I think it says easy, but it looks like it says trashy. Yes, it does, which <laughs> is like, hmm. Okay, I think it says easy. Anyway, um, so, uh, oh yeah, it's an that the easy. It's the name of the vehicle. So the mod easy three is a retro style class two bike complete with a sidecar that looks like it's straight out of Indiana Jones and the last Cru crusade. I actually do want this though. Th that's the thing. Like, I think that this is neat and, and stylish and a talking point, but it's not something that I'd be racing around town in, um, unless I'm going to some event to show off a, a collectible right, like electric a vehicle bike. show or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this is not my daily driver um, by any stretch, but um, I think it's neat. So it says uh, nailing this look wasn't the initial goal of mod bike founder Dor Korngold. Um, in the interview with ours, Korngold said that the mod easy was the first bike he designed for himself. It started with me wanting to have a classic cruiser, he said, but he didn't have a sketch or final design in mind on the outset. Instead, the design was based on what parts he had in his garage. <laughs> so... Um, and I don't know, maybe we were talking over it, but just to make sure everybody knows, this is an article over at ArsTechnica.com by Beth Bull. Um, so I guess this was the early version of the bike, but it's an electric bike. That one doesn't look electric, does it? Like the, the original? Right. It doesn't look like it, but I don't know if there's like gearing somewhere else or something. I don't know. But this has pedals as well. Um, so I don't know how it's actually all strung together. Let's see? So maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, I, thought I don't know much electric. about how e-bikes operate. Well, usually there's either a hub or there's some, like something that's driving the chain that might exist. And so you have the same derailleur and, and all of the mechanics of a bike except that it's powered by an electric motor somewhere. Um, maybe it's in the hub here. I don't know. Um, so they go in, <laughs> they go deeper into this, um, but it's cute. I mean, they've got so those little... on the podcast. There's a, looks like a woman riding the bike with a kid in the sidecar. Yep. And they got their helmet and their safety gear on. So, Kath says me want. <laughs> yeah, see, I want to. <laughs> and this looks like a great place to ride it, right? You're not out yeah. there on the highway or something. Yeah, you're you're not going to lose your mind out here. Um, so it says some things to consider with the sidecar. All that said, the sidecar is not the practical option for adding a small passenger to your bike. There's the obvious and unavoidable reality that a sidecar Add significant width uh, while corn gold worked out to make it as slim and streamlined as possible. The 42 pound sidecar mounted onto the uh, side makes the bike four feet, three inches wide. And this can make getting around certain places tricky. You also have to worry about turns and stuff like that because it changes the center of gravity um, and how you actually turn. You run a chance if you take a turn too sharp, um, flipping one way or the other. Um, so it it's yeah, not as straightforward a problem yeah. so yeah you're kind of thick there if you have the sidecar attached to it um and yeah, i don't think that the there's a podcast much... that shows bollards up on the path yeah good you so let's see oh and they they focus really a lot on the um sidecar aspect of it so they also talk about the motor gears, brakes, and controls. Um, it's a pedal assist that has five levels, hydraulic disc brakes, um, torque sensors, um, seven speed derailleur, shifter moved through the gears efficiently according to them, but that's actually something that can change over time. So, um, so the easy mod bike has a MOD Samsung 48 volt, 15 amp hour, 720 watt amp hour, or sorry, watt hour um, battery that promises a 50 to 100 mile range. And they said that it tracks with their experience. They charge it after 25 miles uh, when it fell to about 50%. So 
I guess with the bike or with the sidecar. Oh yeah, most of that mileage was with the sidecar. Oh, attached. okay. So that like doubled the weight of the vehicle. So yeah, 50 to 100 miles is probably accurate. So I won't go into all of the minutia of assembly of this thing because that changes with the skill of the assembler. So um, seems pretty neat. So yeah, as much as the uh, financiers of Ometown, uh, all the taxpayers in, in uh, Ometown I uh, don't want to hear it. I want this. So. Yeah, they might not appreciate it if the mayor is driving this around. But it's eco-friendly. And finally, the last article for our wanted show. And right after this one, um, in uh, about, well, 15 minutes after I'm done with the show, I will have Warcrafters, which is a gaming show, first person shooters and um, survival crafting base building kind of games um not really arcadey kind of games but we do cover a lot of gaming stuff so if you're interested in all things gaming stick around come on back in about 15 minutes after the end of the show i have to reset um so this last article is in four wheel tech which is tomorrow's show final show as a matter of fact Honda reveals a cute tiny electric van for the Japanese market because you know what? If you drive this vehicle anywhere in the United States and get into an accident, yeah, they'll probably find you ultimately in the Chinese market after you've been hit by an F-150 here in the States. Oh no, I thought you were gonna say something like you'd get laughed at if you drove it down the road <laughs> in the US. Well, like the Scion XB, you'd think people would giggle at that too, but actually a lot of people really like it. I really like it. Um, but this- it has a similar shape to this, although this is probably smaller. This thing comes out, it looks like a Kai truck, um, but so Honda reveals a cute tiny electric van for the Japanese market, a box fun of, uh, sorry, a box full of fun that's available in numerous configurations. And this looks like a Pixar vehicle, like out of cars kind of a thing. Um, there's 11 photos that you can thumb through when you follow the link through Ometown. <laughs> what kind of character do you think would have the yellow one? God, you put me on the spot. I don't know. Uh, they both provoke kind of a mater kind of personality. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> um, Which we did see a mater like truck today. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. That had been there for 20 years <clears throat> and just noticed today. So uh, the model isn't entirely new. It's unveiled in December, 2022, though details were few and far between. It's based on a three cylinder powered van released in Japan in 2018. From a styling perspective, not a lot changed over the past year and a half. The N van, N van E, is that? Oh, it is a Kai van, by the way. So its name is literally N dash van space E. They must follow like Sony's naming conventions. What the hell are they doing with the naming of this vehicle? N. Dash I van. bet there's an N van that's not electric, and now this is the N van E. Which but it's means not just electric. E, it's got a colon I after know. it. Every time <laughs> you see it, it. <laughs> it has the E colon in it. Look, there it is again. Oh my gosh, this is actually killing me. So, okay, I'm going to go down this line. I'm going to read this entire sentence. Honda has several use cases in mind, and there's a version to suit nearly every customer. The lineup will initially include four trim levels called E colon L4, E colon Fun, E colon G, and E colon L2, respectively. I'm not sure what they're respective of. The uh, L4 has four seats, as its name vaguely imp imp uh, implies. And it's designed with both commercial and leisure uh, users in mind. The Fun also has four seats, but it's more leisure oriented trim of the bunch. It's it noticeably gets a nicer interior. That must be the yellow one. 
<laughs> Why? Because it looks fancier? Yeah, I have no idea. So the G has one seat and a reshaped dashboard to let users carry longer items. And the L2 has two seats in a tandem configuration. Do you see people going into the dealership and going, I want an in van E colon, or do they just point and go, would you give me the that yellow one, one please? <laughs> I want yellow. What flavor would you like? Purple. Ah, prices range from, and these numbers are like spectacular when you see it, but then you have to do the translation, um, the exchange rate, you know, 2 million. 439,800 yen for a single seater to 2,000, 2 million, 919,400 yen for the fun version, because fun is 500,000 yen more. Anyway, the figures represent around 15,600 to 18,600 respectively at the current conversion rate. Yeah. Wow. It's twice as expensive as the N van base, non-electric. Wow, the ice vehicle, yeah. The ice, yeah. What? Look at that. But it looks like a bread van. I wish I had actual scale. But back in the like 50s and 60s, there were these big um, bread vans that had back doors that were like human height tall that you could open like barn doors, right? Um, and it was just, they're so awesome. I want them. I want one of those. I want one of these, um, because I've always wanted like a utility kind of a van, um, because I want to do like in sneakers, I want to build it out with a bunch of tech and be, be basically a, a mobile, uh, tech service. Right. Um, and because of what I do when I'm not mayor, I love the idea of being able to go and do these tech demonstrations. So Kath says, rightfully, these are babies compared to um, those 50s, 60s trucks. No, that's true. Maybe these are. The, this is Can't what think happened. of what I was trying to say. <laughs> this is what happens when a bread van from the 50s and a Mini Cooper fall in love. All right, we're going to jump in our Kai car and mash that pedal down because you don't stomp on the gas in these things you you mash the pedal down and you hear like a little whizzing sound like somebody's pulled the the plastic zip cord on the toy mm -hmm. car on those toys zzz, yeah zzz, and then you race off down main street looking vigorously left and right at all the articles we've talked about we've run really long for today's show but that's okay we're in the wanted channel so that's all that matters go look around become a citizen of ometown.com and go through all of these articles i mean we have over 1.1 million headlines dun, dun, dun. Uh, covering a broad expanse of topics all aggregated so that marawat and the sentient ai from the future can manage their information overload and it works, folks. At least it works for us. Um, that said, we're done with the Wanted show. We will be back in about mm, 10 minutes uh, to get the Warcrafter show on the road. And we'll actually, maybe, uh, we'll hit our start time for it. So what a what a day. So Marowat is out in the sentient AI. I'm going to get that neuron. No. Oh, daggone it. <laughs> Squishing your neurons. Want to say bye? <laughs> Good night, hometown citizens. Come back for Warcrafters. We'll see you shortly. Kath, impressive? Which one is impressive? I'm not sure. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Stick around, everybody. We'll be right back. And the chat never really ends, at least, at least not on my end. So if you're still in chat, um, the bot actually operates. Oh, number of articles. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah, we uh, I've actually been using this for an extended period of time, only opening it up to the public for the last two and a half years. Um, and so, yeah, it's 
quite a bit. And we're adding more and more content because, um, well, I'm always, I'm thirsty for more, more information. And um, yeah, there's never enough. So see you in about 10 minutes.